So this is a talk I gave about a year ago in French, and uh, so I've updated it a bit since then. And it's on the subject of so-called Islamophobia. And the, the most important thing that needs to be said about uh, so-called Islamophobia is that it's, it's, the, it's the accusation of blasphemy in the 21st century, except that it's blasphemy against a particular religion and not against religion in general, which makes it even more problematic because it's, uh, it's like uh, blasphemy against one particular highly sensitive uh, uh, religion, which has uh, fundamentalist members who are extremely sensitive to criticism. And, and it serves as a, as a way to, the accusations of Islamophobia serve as a way of condemning and repressing criticism of, of religions in general, but of course, especially Islam. And uh, our goal uh, of our organization, Atheist Free Thinkers, is, is to get uh, organizations which fight against blasphemy laws to recognize that, that Islam, they need to fight against the use of Islamophobia as well. Uh, even though there may not be laws that specifically deal with it, uh, there are there are laws that are being put into effect uh, uh, as time goes by uh, that talk about Islamophobia. So it's becoming a, a serious problem, the, the use of Islamophobia as a way of, of silencing criticism of, of Islam. Now, th there's already uh, an organization called End Blasphemy Laws, uh, which has a worldwide campaign with the goal to repeal uh, blasphemy laws uh, globally throughout the world in all countries. Uh, it was founded by uh, International Humanist Association and the European Humanist Federation. Um, and uh, they, they've had uh, some success. As you know, there's no, there's no blasphemy law in Canada anymore. Blasphemy laws have been uh, repealed in, uh, uh, in Ireland and uh, or weakened in some other countries, but there's a lot that are still left on the books and especially in Muslim majority countries. Um, the, the charter of that, of that uh, organization is, uh, is that blasphemy laws violate freedom of expression and they deny equality. Um, the, the, when they're enforced, they infringe and violate human rights. Um, and there are, uh, there are, there are laws against uh, sort of hate speech and things like that, which are sort of uh, uh, passive blasphemy laws. Uh, they may not mention the word blasphemy, but they, um, they tend to strengthen blasphemy laws and add to them. And, um, Blasphemy laws have been repudiated by, uh, by international law and, and governance bodies. Uh, we'll see that the, the UN has taken a, a, a good decision in that direction. And uh, as I mentioned, blasphemy laws are sometimes hidden under other language. And that's, that's the case with uh, so-called hate speech or so-called defamation of religion or, or so-called Islamophobia. Um, now, the Humanist International, which is one of the two organizations which, uh, uh, which founded this uh, End Blasphemy Laws campaign, they've had some success. Uh, they've got uh, uh, the United Nations Human Rights Council to declare uh, that uh, the accusation of Islamophobia is now widely used as an ad hominem attack. Uh, to silence opponents by equating criticism of Islam with racism. And uh, in 2015, uh, it declared that, the is that is Islamophobia is an isolationist term which encourages divisive identity, po uh, identity politics. So this, th this is uh, starting to be a good criticism of, uh, of, uh, uh, of Islamophobia. But what's lacking is... Um, is they need to uh, they they need to distinguish between uh, they need to end the the conflation of race with religion. The idea that that uh, Islamophobia is a form of racism is nonsense because Islam is not a race, and and also um, 
you know, the the fact that uh, it, it's, a, it's a vehicle of identity politics, which is very damaging because it works against uh, universal principles. Now, I, I want to talk about this particular book because it's, um, uh, which came out a few years ago. It's a, it's in French, it was a, a French Quebecois collaboration. And uh, it's a very good resource to understand the origin of the term and, uh, and, and how, it, how it is used currently. Um, it turns out that the term goes back, it, it's, uh, it was originally coined in French, apparently, Islamophobie, uh, and over a century ago by a colonial bureaucrat in the, in the French Ministry of Colonies. And he, he, he invented the term Islamophobia uh, to criticize uh, his colleagues who might have a prejudice against Islam. But the reason, he, <laughs> the reason he criticized their attitude was very interesting. Basically, he said that um, Islam is a very useful religion for the, for the colonial regime because uh, he saw Black African natives who practiced animism to be unproductive Whereas if they were Islamicized, they would become productive and obedient servants of their colonial masters. And so, although he apparently saw Islam as inferior to Christianity, it was better than the native religions and should be promoted in order to facilitate the French colonial regime. So <laughs> the origin of the term is, is rather dubious. Then the, then the term fell out, of, uh, fell out of use and nobody used it again until the end of the 20th century. Uh, and then it came into English as well, and it's uh, and it's it's now used, well, ex I would say exclusively by Islamists and by those who are their allies or their dupes, uh, and it and it's uh, it's used as a as a way to censor criticism of Islam, um, and and it and it serves to prevent any reform or moder modernization of religion. Uh, because if you can't criticize it, then you can't reform it. Um, now I'm going to, we're going to look at a few quotations from other parts of the, some of the authors in this book. This is a quotation from Hassan Jamali, who's, uh, he is a, he's a, a, a teacher here in Montreal uh, of Syrian origin. And he says that the notion of Islamophobia exists for the sole purpose of restricting freedom of expression and scaring those who defend secularism and dare to speak out against religious accommodation. Uh, and uh, public institutions in Quebec have, have fallen into this trap. Now, uh, and uh, I assume you're familiar with the, with the expression religious accommodation. It basically means uh, accommodating uh, religious privilege in, in, in public services, giving, giving certain, uh, uh, certain privileges to, to religious believers. For, well, for example, allowing them to wear uh, religious symbols even while they're working as civil servants, that's an example of religious uh, accommodation. And uh, the term has come into a wide use in, in that context. Um, there's a, a good quote from, uh, from uh, Henri Pénin Ruiz, who is a French philosopher, and he's an authority on secularism. He's a universalist. He, he rejects the essentialization of religious affiliation. And the essentialization is like racializing it, like as if it were an innate property, which it isn't. The religious affiliation is just a, an opinion, like a, uh, like a political opinion. And he writes uh, in, uh, he has this uh, sort of a dictionary of secular, secularism. He, under the, the paragraph Islamophobia, he says, no one can be reduced to just one's religion. One has a religion, but one is not one's religion. Um, the same is true for a people. Even if one belongs to the majority, a religious or spiritual affiliation is necessarily an individual attribute and may not be forced upon everyone in the group. In other words, no one is defined by their religious affiliation. It's just one aspect and uh, he, he has a universal uh, appro universalist approach where he rejects uh, strong identity politics. Um, this is uh, Zineb al-Razwi, who is uh, 
formerly uh, uh, journalist with uh, Charlie Hebdo, uh, that you've heard of. Um, and her, uh, she has stated, commenting on the word Islamophobia, to fear Islam is eminently justifiable, natural, and normal. So Islamophobia is, in my opinion, an ideological imposture, meaning when it's used as an accusation, which in Western democracies ultimately amounts to imposing a crime of blasphemy. So it's, it's like an accusation of blasphemy. Uh, you've, in Quebec, uh, Bill 21 uh, is a secular legislation which, uh, among other things, uh, bans some civil service from wearing religious symbols uh when they're on the job but only when they're on the job and uh the opposition has been particularly virulent and they've made use of the islamophobia slur in their in their uh criticisms for example uh in an article published in uh two years uh three years ago now two health professional professionals at mcgill university said that bill 21 could have regrettable consequences for quebecers health which is rather absurd. Uh, uh, racism and Islamophobia may cause depression, anxiety, and psychological stress. And they didn't bother to distinguish between race, racism and Islamophobia. They lumped them together as so many people often do. Around the same time uh, in McLean's magazine, uh, they said that uh, Bill 21 is repugnant. Uh, the strain and stain of Islamophobia runs deep in Canada and arguably stronger in Quebec than elsewhere. So they use uh, the accusation of uh, Islamophobia to demonize anyone who, uh, well, demonize basically most Quebecers because most Quebecers support Bill 21. Uh, in the New York Times, uh, Dan Bilevsky associates Bill 21 with uh, murderous anti-Muslim violence, fomenting hatred and, once again, Islamophobia. And... Um, Perhaps most serious of all was uh, when, when Bill 21 was challenged before the courts in November and December of, uh, of 2020. And uh, uh, the, the, the opposition was, was really virulent. Um, for example, uh, the sociologist Paul Ide, who was an expert witness for um, for a teach one teachers union which did not consult its members before it <laughs> before it uh, started uh, a court case uh, challenging Bill 21 and for the English Montreal School Board um, he used language such as uh, Islamophobia and racialized a lot and when the judge asked him how one can equate hostility against religious minorities with racism he replied that he rejected the, distinct, the distinction between the two and it, that he did not even understand the question. Uh, so we can see that they're conflating race and religion. Uh, the, the judge wasn't, but the, the sociologist was, and, and, and so did uh, so many other of the, of the people who were challenging the, the bill before the court. And the, the most outrageous example was uh, the lawyer Azim Hussein, who represented several opponents of the law. And he declared that Islamophobia is a form of racism. He claimed that Quebecers strong support for secularism as compared to Canadians outside Quebec is, is not explained by their lower, lower religiosity, which other people accept, but, but rather by Islamophobia once again. And he compared Bill 21 to the Nazis Nuremberg laws, which is outrageous. And that same uh, lawyer, Azim Hussein, a year later, in December of 2021, he was named as a judge to that same court, Quebec Superior Court, Superior Court, when he, where he made these utterly outrageous uh, allegations. Uh, there are organizations which uh, claim to fight against Islamophobia. For example, in France, there was an organization called the uh, Collective Against Islamophobia in France, which had affinities with the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, which is a major Islamist group. Uh, they would publish dubious statistics about so-called Islamophobic events. But um, when they were about to be disbanded in, uh, in 2020, when the government was preparing to disband the organization because they had been uh, involved in 
in the campaign against uh, the teacher, Samuel Paty, who was assassinated, who was beheaded because he, uh, because he showed some cartoons of Mohammed during a, during a lesson uh, as, a, as a school teacher. Uh, the government was about to disband this organization and it disbanded itself <laughs> first before the government uh, had a chance to do that. But it reconstituted itself in neighboring Belgium, just changed its name with the, the F to a B. So it's now the collective against Islamophobia in Belgium, and not France, but it, it unfortunately survived. Um, now, I mentioned the Muslim Bar Brotherhood. Uh, Hani Ramadan is, you've heard of Tariq Ramadan. Both Hani Ramadan and Tariq Ramadan are, uh, are grandsons of um, Hassan al-Banna, who was a, a founder of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, a very important Islamist organization founded in, in Egypt in 1928. And they, they both live in uh, Switzerland, uh, the last I heard, uh, Hani does. And he, he, here's an example of a tweet from him. He says, Muslims have the right to draw up a list of those who encourage Islamophobia in France under the pretext of attacking Islam, a dangerous catch-all concept. He's claiming that Islam, Islamism doesn't doesn't really exist. And, and we can note their names of elected officials who stand out in this regard. Uh, Islamophobia is a crime. Well, of course, Islamophobia is not a crime. Uh, it, it, there's no law in France against it. Uh, but he, what he's saying is he's suggesting basically drawing a, a, a target on the back of any, any person who who talks about Islamism, uh, Islamism and criticizes it. And uh, it's like encouraging death threats. That's, that's, the, that's what I see in this quote, in this tweet from him. Um, another commentator, Mohammed Sifawi is a Franco-Algerian investigative journalist who, who specializes in reporting on Islamism and or, organized crime. And he is, of course, very critical of, uh, of Islamism. And uh, he very, very critical of the use of the, of the word Islamophobia as, a, as an accusation. He calls it an intellectual scam that aims to atrophy debate. And uh, this is in a, in a book uh, of the title, with the title, Grave Diggers of the Republic. Islamo leftism and the, the term uh, Islamo gauchism in French or Islamo leftism in English is a term that describes uh, so called left wing groups which are extremely um, complacent with regard to Islamism. They never criticize it. They even may consider Islamists to be allies in their, in their struggle against capitalism, which is uh, insane in my opinion to, to, to make an alliance with, with such uh, Islamists are extreme right wing. It doesn't make any sense, but these are, uh, he's referring to people on the left who ally themselves with uh, the extreme right wing Islamists. Um, another example of the use of, uh, of uh, the term, the president of Turkey uh, has stated, and this is quoted by another uh, French journalist, Céline Pinan, uh, tomorrow, uh, according to the Turkish president, tomorrow, no European, no Western will be able to take a step in safety with peace of mind in the street anywhere in the world. Um, he, he, he qualifies... Uh, Europe as fundamentally Islamophobic and racist, uh, trampling on human rights because it refuses Sharia law and the veil on its soil. Well, there are some restrictions on the veil, of course, in civil, especially in civil services. But you know, he's conflating Islamophobia and racism. He's making an outrageous threat against uh, many countries. Uh, he, he's, a, he's an Islamist fanatic. Uh, President of Turkey. In, 
in, at the, in the late uh, 2019, and this is, this is an example of uh, Islamo-leftism in action. There was, a, there was a demonstration against Islamophobia uh, where a lot of so-called left-wing groups participated. And, and it, was, it was an alliance between ally, uh, Islamists and these uh, ideologically corrupted left-wing groups, which uh, I, I would not consider them leftists anymore I, because they have, uh, by allying themselves with Islamists, they've abandoned uh, the, the values of, of the enlightenment and the, the values of uh, human rights and rationalism and, and reason, which left should depend and, and secularism. And, uh, Writing in the in the pages of, of Charlie Hebdo, Riss, who's editor in chief, one of the survivors of that horrible massacre back in January 2015, when when uh, some a dozen members or ten, I think, uh, members of the editorial board of Charlie Hebdo were uh, were massacred by two Islamists, he 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 comments on this demonstration, and uh, he says it's a significant date because it's a significant date in the disintegration of the left. Um, the fight against racism and discrimination is a key issue for democracy, but to be combated effectively, racism and discrimination must, not, must be precisely identified. It's not enough to wrongly designate supposed racists to obtain an anti-racism certificate, nor is it justified to point the finger at all Muslims for fighting, Islam, for fighting Islamism, as unfortunately far-right parties do in Europe. War is too important a thing to be entrusted to soldiers, said Clemenceau. Uh, but when we hear certain self-proclaimed proclaimed, anti-racism activists accuse anyone of anything, we think that the fight against racism is too important a thing to be entrusted to such irresponsible people. Um, now, when it comes to censorship, I identify two, two types of censorship. There's the legal censorship, which we're all familiar with, imposed by the state using laws, laws against blasphemy or hate speech or whatever. But I also use the word censorship to identify social censorship, which I use to refer to censorship which is imposed by, by media or by one's peers, where certain things you can't talk about without getting uh, canceled or, or without getting showered with accusations of xenophobia or Islamophobia or without being sun, shunned socially. Um, I, I call that social censorship. It's not, as, it's, not as, it's not as bad as legal censorship normally because it's not as strict. It's not imposed by the state. Uh, you're not going to get thrown into prison but you might lose friends or even your job, uh, lose your reputation. It, it, it's social censorship is uh, nevertheless very dangerous, even though it's not as uh, rigid as legal censorship. Um, now there, there are some, there has been some motions against so-called Islamophobia passed by various legislatures uh, there was one passed in 2015, unfortunately, by the National Assembly of Quebec. It was a resolution by Fra uh, Francoise David, who's a representative of Quebec Solidaire, which is a, it's an Islam or leftist uh, party here in, in uh, Quebec. And uh, the L'Assemblement pour la laïcité, the, the, uh, which is a secular group, uh, a coalition that, that our organization belongs to, it declared its disagreement with this um, with this motion, we oppose any motion against Islamophobia because it, it just stifles uh, criticism of religion. And you've heard of um, motion M103 adopted by the federal government, uh, by the federal parliament of Canada in March of 2017. It condemns Islamophobia and all forms of systemic racism and religious discrimination. In other words, it conflates race with religion, which is completely unacceptable because race is a, an innate uh, immutable property and religion is just an, is just an opinion. And uh, it uses the expression systemic racism, which is, 
well. They don't define what Islamophobia means. They don't define what systemic racism means. But we all recognize the jargon of a certain uh, uh, regressive left uh, woke movement. Uh, systemic racism is a very dubious uh, uh, concept, uh, very fashionable. And then uh, following up on motion M103, there was a parliamentary committee which issued a report uh, and uh, that report uh, had a number of recommendations, uh, but the, the main thing it does, the main danger from that report is it continues the conflation of race and religion with religion, and it allows religious organizations to sort of piggyback on the anti-racist movement and use uh, funds which, are, which were allocated to fight racism and use those funds uh, to fight against so-called religious discrimination, which really means uh, using federal money to, to oppose criticism of religion. Now, accusations of Islamophobia can have very serious, even deadly consequences. You've heard of Mila, a young woman in France who, who, who made very negative comments about Islam on social media, and she's had many death threats, lives under uh, police protection. Uh, her life has been completely changed, and she, she's not safe anywhere. You've heard of Samuel Paty, who was um, assassinated, decapitated by an Islamist because he used uh, a cartoon of Mohammed in a, in a in a lesson he gave to his students in a, in a school, uh, roughly high school level. And the, 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 even though uh, there's no law against blasphemy in France, there's no law against Islamophobia, nevertheless, all, the, all this, this uh, social censorship, there's no legal censorship, but there is social censorship, which Islamists use and Islamists and their their allies of the Islamist Islamo left Islamo gauche, and and uh, that creates an atmosphere in which these kinds of events can occur uh, with very serious consequences. Uh, now, of course, if we go to a country like Pakistan, it's, the situation is far worse. Pakistan does have uh, a law against blasphemy, and very very backward uh, legislation. And there are, there are many, um, many cases of people being uh, attacked or killed, often assassinated. And, and often what happens is they get executed extrajudicially. That is, they may be accused of blasphemy and there's a blasphemy law, but it doesn't ever go to court because a mob kills them first. They get massacred by, uh, by, uh, by a mob before before there's any trial or anything. Uh, and there have been several examples in many over the last few decades. And in Nigeria, in Northern Nigeria, there's a very recent example I, I'm sure you heard of where um, a bunch of uh, young Muslims murdered a, a young Christian woman because, well, they said that she said something blasphemous, probably something totally innocent, but and uh, they beat her to death. This is in northern Nigeria, where I believe uh, um, where Muslims are, con are concentrated. I, I think that it's in the south that there are more Christians. But she was a Christian living in that area. Um, so in, in a country where the crime of blasphemy exists, uh, the extrajudicial repression of, of so-called blasphemy is, is even worse, uh, Pakistan and Nigeria being two examples. Whoops, sorry, I just, um, uh, let me get back to my presentation. Whoops. Okay. My apologies for that little mistake. Now, um, as you 
may aware may be aware apostasy that is abandoning your religion is is forbidden in in islam it's considered to be a horrible sin and in several muslim majority countries it is severely punished by law even by the death penalty so there's no respect for freedom of conscience um accusations of islamophobia or when it's used as if it were synonymous with racism and, and you you know with the accuser conflates race with religion that's racializing the racial the religious affiliation it's 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 similar it's like the light version of uh, the ban on apostasy it's like uh, the person is labeled by their religion they can't get away from it uh, the, pr the person is a prisoner of the religion into which they happen to be born uh, and so by by conflating race with religion you're in, you're strengthening this ban on apostasy. Um, we, you perhaps you remember a few years ago that uh, Justin Trudeau, our current prime minister, uh, he complained that uh, why do people uh, not like the word Islamophobia? We talk about homophobia all the time. There's no, there's even a day for that, but Islamophobia bothers us. Well, <laughs> they're completely different. Uh, Islam and its variant Islamism are ideologies. Homosexuality is not. And, and, to, and to draw a parallel between Islamophobia and homophobia, it's, it's an insult to the dignity of homosexual persons. Uh, and, and, it, and again, it, it, it prevents uh, even Muslims themselves from, from criticizing their own religion. He's essentializing religious affiliation as if it were biologically determined. Uh, as if it were something innate, like uh, like a homosexual orientation, it's a, it's a denial of freedom of conscience. In Britain, there is a an all party parliamentary group which, in 2018, came up with a definition, uh, not a very good one, a very bad definition of Islamophobia. And they say that Islamophobia is rooted in racism and is a type of racism that targets expressions of Muslims, Muslimness or perceived Muslimness. Okay, th this is a really bad definition because once again, conflating with race uh, as if, as if uh, being in Islam were an innate thing and not just a religion. Uh, it's essentializing the religious affiliation again. And, and also uh, it's, it's mixing up criticism of a religion with prejudice against people, which is another a major problem with the term Islamophobia. Uh, literally, Islamophobia means fear or irrational fear of Islam. Well, that's fearing a, a, an ideology, you know, that's, uh, which is not the same as a prejudice against people. It's important to distinguish. Um, And you may have heard of the Bathley Grammar School in, in England, where in uh, about a year ago, uh, a case uh, similar to the Samuel Petit case in France, although in this case, there was no loss of life, I believe, fortunately, but uh, he presented a, a teacher in the school, presented a cartoon of Muhammad, there were demonstrations of angry Islamists uh, who demanded his firing. The uh, headmaster of the school, formally apologized, which was totally inappropriate because there's nothing, there was nothing to apologize for. Uh, the teacher fears for his life, his career is probably over. And the, the, the definition which I showed you in the previous uh, slide about uh, this really bad definition of Islamophobia, that, that kind of nonsense uh, validates and encourages this kind of reaction and, 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 and threatens the the welfare and even the lives of, of people such as this teacher. Now, I would like to propose um, three terms which we need to use. I don't, like you, I don't like the term Islamophobia for reasons I've given. We need to use the term Islamolatry, like, like idolatry, Islamolatry. It's, it's an extreme attitude of respect for or admiration or submission to Islam or even Islamism, but not as a believer, rather as a non-Muslim who 
who opposes frank criticism of Islam. And there are a lot of people on the so-called left who are Islamolatric in my view. Islamo complacency is similar. It's an attitude of complacency with regard to political Islam, underestimating or ignoring its danger. And Islamo leftism, I've already talked about that some from the French Islamo gauchism. Uh, it's a degenerate form of left wing politics in which the priority, which the left traditionally accorded to questions of class, is now replaced by the defense of minorities, especially Muslims, as if Muslims constituted the new working class as in Marxist ideology, or the new chosen people, as in Abrahamic mythology. Uh, now, some good news. In the United Nations, this is 11 years old, but uh, after many, it's still uh, excellent news, after many years in which the OCI, the Organization uh, for um, Islamic Cooperation, which is a uh, a coalition of uh, Muslim majority countries. They tried to get the uh, United Nations to condemn so-called defamation of religion and Islamophobia, uh, but they had less and less uh, success over the years. And uh, finally, in 2011, uh, in, in 2011, one moment, um, the Human Rights Committee of the United Nations adopted a declaration which states that any ban on manifestations of disrespect for a religion or other belief system, including anti-blasphemy laws, is incompatible with the UN's International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. This is excellent news. It means that any criminalization of blasphemy in a signatory country violates the pact. And that was reaffirmed uh, a few months later by um, no, that's the end of that. Sorry, my mistake. However, uh, a recent setback, a resolution proclaimed by um, the General Assembly, a resolution adopted by the General Assembly uh, on the 14th of March, of an international day to combat Islamophobia. The resolution was introduced by Pakistan, uh, which uh, asserted that uh, Islamophobia was, uh, has emerged as a new form of racism, uh, which among other things includes discriminatory travel bans, hate speech, and the targeting of girls and women for their dress. So obviously the point of this resolution, well, they're, once again, they're conflating race with religion as if a religious affiliation were any problem, which is the, the negation of freedom of conscience. And they're obviously trying to target any law, which such as in France or Quebec, which uh, limits the wearing of religious symbols by civil servants when they're on duty. Um, so this is a major setback and it's very recent. Also, another uh, major setback, although I don't think, I don't think it's been passed into law, but it's, it's passed um, the House of Representatives in the United States, but not, by the, not yet by the Senate in the United States. It's a, a bill to combat international, uh, it's the Combating International Home of Islamophobia Act. It establishes within the, within the Department of State the office to monitor and combat Islamophobia and address related in issues. So this is this is very. If it gets passed, it could be very dangerous. It's it's supposed to have international scope. So is the United States going to start, you know, interfering in other countries and and, and uh, forcing them to censor criticism of Islam? And by the way, this was um, uh, introduced by Congresswoman. Um, Omar, Ilhan Omar, uh, she wears the hijab, including when she's sitting in the House of Representatives. And uh, headgear was banned in the House of Representatives for almost two centuries. But that regulation was changed in order to accommodate her. It was changed to allow an exception for religious reasons, thus violating separation between religion and state, giving a privilege to religions 
she she can wear her religious headdress, but other forms of head covering are, are banned. And in conclusion, it's been long. Thank you for your patience. Um, Islamophobia is like a, a criminalization of blasphemy. We, we must fight against the, the use of this term as, as an accusation. Uh, social censorship and threats of extrajudicial consequences add to the threats from legal censorship. Uh, we must denounce the conflation of race and religion, which implies the denial of freedom of conscience. We must stop letting people racialize religion, essentialize it, if it were as if it were an aid. And there's a final point: uh, apostasy, the the right to apost to to leave one's religion is absolutely crucial. And so, the defense of ex-Muslims is very important because Islam. Uh, bans apostasy. So those who, Muslims who want to leave that religion need to be defended. And I've uh, just got a few links to resources here. We can maybe talk about them in the, in the uh, question period. And I wanted to mention that uh, Jamila Benabib has a new book out, just came out. I haven't, I haven't got a copy. I haven't read it. Uh, Islamophobia. Islamophobia, my eye. Islamophobia, my eye. <laughs> so that uh, looks like uh, a very interesting read from uh, Jamila Benabib. Well, thank you for your attention.